Coming up on ITV News London, why the Met is failing some victims of domestic abuse. Coming soon to Reading, the Mayor announces an expansion to Crossrail and to Stevenage and beyond. The Mars Rovers being given the test run before their big mission. Those stories and more at six. Coming up, making sure you sleep well tonight. The app designed in London that lets you pick your dreams at six. Good evening, welcome to the ITV News in London. Tonight's main stories. The Mets accused of failing to protect some victims of domestic abuse. Every time a mistake is made by the police in this particular area, it does create increased risks for victims. Next stop, Reading. Crossrail will now be extended even further west. Getting a good night's sleep, the app that lets you control your dreams. And is there life on Stevenage? Why well, visit here is out of this world. Hello, I'm Lucrezia Millerini. The Met Police has been accused of failing to protect some victims of domestic abuse by an official watchdog. A report found that despite the force's high arrest rates for abuse, a lack of staff training and equipment is potentially putting people in danger. While the Met was praised for its leadership on the issue, it failed to flag serial and repeat abusers, meaning vulnerable victims are not being identified. Ruth Banks has been looking at the findings. Every 30 seconds, police receive a call about domestic abuse. In London, it accounts for 7% of all crimes. But today, inspectors have warned that lives are being put at risk because of shortcomings in the police response. The Met is praised for doing better than many other forces across the country. But the report found there were weaknesses in staff training. There was sometimes a conflict between prioritising domestic abuse and other crimes and that computer systems failed to identify repeat victims when they called for help. That's a really important problem. If you've had it happen several times and you've rung the police on several occasions and that's not identified, then the level of risk isn't properly assessed and the officers might not have the right information when they go to the scene. So that's a problem. I spoke to one victim who suffered years of abuse from her husband. When I had our first child, our son, um, that's when the violence started. Um, and then it became hitting, pushing, pulling hair and throttling. She called the police several times but found the response extremely mixed. You get some people who are very empath empathic and others who are ticking boxes and there was <clears throat> one female officer who, after taking my statement, um, said to me, right, so um, I take it you'll be divorcing this man then. And I just looked at her and I said, well, no. And she sort of laughed, closed a notebook and said, well, we'll be seeing you soon then. Um, and that was their response. The Met says it's already taken steps to address the issues highlighted by inspectors. We're quite pleased that the recommendations pretty much reinforce what we'd already identified as possible weaknesses in the way we approach domestic abuse and it's just sort of re-emphasised the need to fully embed this continuous improvement plan across London. Domestic violence charities are calling for a full public inquiry into how these crimes are investigated. Ruth Banks, ITV News. Well, Isabel Sherlaw is from Refuge, who work with victims of domestic abuse. Isabel, thank you for coming to speak to us this evening. What do you make of the findings of this report, given that, at worst, we're talking about people losing their lives? Yes, well, Refuge is, is horrified mm. by the findings of this report. Unfortunately, we're, we're not that surprised. Mm. Refuge has been campaigning for the past 40 years for improvements to police response because we, we know from the women and children in our services, from what they tell us, from numerous IPCC reports, serious case reviews, mm. domestic homicide reviews, that the police are failing women in this country on a staggering scale. Mm. You, you say you've been campaigning for 40 years. We see the very high profile public campaigns on, on TV. What's going wrong? Why, why are we still hearing things like we're hearing today? 
Well, the HMIC report has actually done a very effective diagnosis of the mm. problems. We're seeing there are problems with attitudes, there are neg there's a negative culture often mm. um, in the way professionals deal with domestic violence, a lack of understanding, a mm. lack of training, um, a lack of empathy often, um, and a lack of accountability when things go wrong. Is it almost, is it like domestic, cases of domestic abuse are being treated like a second class crime, if you like, because they are obviously by definition within the context of a relationship. Absolutely, they're treated as a second class crime. Mm. They're not taken as seriously as other forms of domestic, of, of, sorry, they're not taken as seriously mm. as other forms of violent crime. And we think that that's a scandal because mm. when women and children experience violent crime, it's disproportionately perpetrated by people that they know. Mm. So we know that women and children are not getting access to justice. Mm. And we think that something has to change. Given that though, is it sometimes difficult for police officers to deal with problems when they do happen within the confines of a relationship and when they are at home? Is it difficult for officers to tackle that? Domestic violence can be confusing mm. to, you know, to the untrained eye. It can be quite complex, which is why it's so important that officers are trained mm. in understanding domestic violence so that they know what are the signs to, to look out for, which are the most dangerous cases so that they can prioritise their resources there. We know that police across the country, including in the Met, don't understand domestic violence. You know, they receive a they receive a call every single thir every thirty seconds. Mm. This is a massive portion of their work. Very quickly, we just heard at the end of Ruth's report there that charities such as Refuge want a public inquiry. Absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, the problems are not only with the police. We know that the CPS are failing to are failing to charge. You know, or they're downgrading crime. Social services failing to protect mm. women and children. Health services, you know, not enabling women, not telling women about places like refuge where they can go. So we would urge anyone watching who wants to you know, be part of the solution mm. to go to Refuge's website and sign our petition. OK, Isabel Scherler from Refuge, thank you. Thank you. A schizophrenic man who escaped from a secure hospital has been found by police. 47-year-old Mark Ricketts absconded from Springfield Hospital in Tooting on Saturday. He had been jailed in 1994 for attacking a man at a tube station with a bread knife. He was found on a bus in Lewisham in the early hours of this morning. And local authorities in the London area will investigate claims TV presenter Jimmy Savile abused children in their care in the 60s, 70s and 80s. A total of 21 institutions will be examined, five of those in or around the capital. It's been revealed a father who was murdered in Islington had won money at a Mayfair casino hours before his death. Mehmet Hassan won £3,000 at poker on Sunday. His body was found in his flat on Monday evening. The Deputy Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police is blaming a catastrophic IT failure for the loss of files on police corruption. Craig Mackey told the London Assembly that files were shredded after they were transferred onto a database which collapsed in 2005. And Tower Hamlets Council is paying for pregnant women, new mothers and children under four to get free vitamins. The council says there's evidence that a large proportion of the population in the borough have low levels of vitamin D. The family of a woman whose shooting by police sparked riots in Brixton in 1985 have told ITV News they're still fighting for a formal apology from the Met. Cherry Gross was paralysed from the waist down when she was accidentally shot by officers raiding her home. Today her son spoke to Rags Martel about the horrific night his mum was injured. I just remember hearing a loud bang. When I opened my eyes I saw my mum laying on the floor and a policeman standing over her with a gun in his hand. When he was 11, Lee Lawrence saw his mother shot by police. I saw blood and I was screaming and shouting, um, what have you done to my mum, what have you done to my mum? And the police man turned around and pointed the gun and said, someone better shut this kid up. He pointed the gun at you? He pointed the gun at me. The shooting sparked the 1985 Brixton riots. Cherry Gross was left paralysed from the waist down. She eventually died from her injuries three years ago. The policeman who shot her, Inspector Douglas Lovelock, stood trial for the shooting but was acquitted. No disciplinary action was ever taken against him. This is the house where Cherry Gross was shot in 1985, but 29 years later her family say there's been another injustice at the forthcoming inquest into her death the family has been denied any type of legal aid.
At the moment, a decision has been made by a legal advisor. According to the Ministry of Justice, this case isn't in the public interest. I think it is disgraceful that in 2014 we have yet another black family seeking justice, not being provided with the support from the state that they deserve. I think it is in a perverse decision of the legal aid agency. How did the Metropolitan Police come to fail as culpably and act as negligently as they clearly did? The public have an interest in finding out the truth. The truth will only be found out when this family are properly represented. This was an innocent mother who was shot, who lost the use of her legs at the age of 37 in their prime. Almost 30 years after she was shot, her family are still waiting for justice. But without proper legal representation, they might have to wait even longer. Rags Martel, ITV News. Just over halfway through its construction and Boris Johnson has announced a radical change to Crossrail. The £15 billion fast train service is to be extended west to include Reading. The mayor praised the decision saying it would open up jobs into London to thousands more people. Our political correspondent Simon Harris has the details. Europe's largest construction project just got a bit bigger. Crossrail, the £15 billion new commuter line being burrowed beneath London, is to be extended into the Thames Valley. Instead of trains terminating at Maidenhead, they'll go on to Reading with an additional stop at Twyford. It's much better to have Crossrail running all the way to Reading so that we can start to unlock some of the many economic benefits that will run through to Reading and the Thames Valley region as a result. Crossrail will now connect Reading and Heathrow with Shenfield in Essex and Abbey Wood in Kent. High-speed trains will serve the city and Canary Wharf. London is often attacked for you know, taking all this, this money, but this is a project that is being very much paid for by London businesses, paid for by, uh, by London as well as the, the, ta as well as the national taxpayer, and, and yet it's benefiting the rest of the country as well. Crossrail is being paid for in part by businesses through a supplementary business rate but it only applies within Greater London, so Reading will get the benefits without having to chip in. We always accepted that it was unfair that other people ought to be chipping in. Uh, we asked the economic development agencies in the home counties to chip in at the time. They didn't want to. We thought, we're not holding it up for this. We've got to get going. Crossrail bosses claim the extension to Reading won't cost any more money. There's no extra tunnelling involved because the trains will run on existing tracks and there should be some savings because fewer facilities will now be needed at Maidenhead. It's a much more elegant solution, I think, for, for Crossrail. It removes the need for some shuttle services that really were bridging a gap here between Reading and Slough and that itself unlocks some more capacity which is so important in the London Thames Valley area. But already questions are being asked about Crossrail to Reading. Why will this supposedly high-speed service take the slow line into London? And what about fares? Transport for London still hasn't done a deal with the train companies to allow Reading commuters to use Oyster cards. Simon Harris, ITV News. If you love the single life, then you're definitely not alone. One London borough has been named the single capital of England, with nearly two-thirds of people living there choosing not to marry. Seven other London boroughs also made it into the top ten. Well, you can find out where England's singleton capital is and see that top ten in full by going to our website, itv.com slash London. You're watching the ITV News in London still to come. Sleep well tonight, the app that can help you pick what you dream about before you go to bed. And the Red Planet Rovers being tested in Stevenage for their next intergalactic mission. But first, for the thousands of people who sleep rough in London, hospitals are often the only place to go for help. Being homeless is tough and it can have a devastating impact on someone's health. Life expectancy for a man sleeping rough is 30 years lower than the average. Now a charity is launching a special service to offer the vital aftercare needed when people are discharged from hospitals. Rhea Chatterjee went to see it in action. What happens to the homeless if they're sick? Wayne knows. He spent long periods of time on the streets, in and out of hospital seven times. I never had really time to be, to be seen. I, I had to get out and we had a lot of stigma, you know, when we were in hospital because of, you know, for homeless people coming in, you know, we ain't exactly in the best place to be, you know, looking physically, you know, mentally. 
and what happens when they leave. Research by the charity St Mungo's and Homeless Link shows only a third of people admitted to hospital had help with their homelessness. Most are discharged and go straight back onto the streets. This hostel come hospital could be the way forward, designed to offer aftercare. If somebody goes into a hospital for appendicitis, they'll be looking mainly at that appendicitis. Um, they won't be looking at the whole person and I think one thing that's different here is that we're looking at the full range of somebody's health needs and often people may have not only physical health needs but mental health needs, they may have a substance misuse problem, they may have a range of other, uh, 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 other difficulties in their personal lives. A team of nurses and psychologists will work with housing support groups to help people move forward as their medical treatment comes to an end. Wayne says the facility is crucial. He remembers the feeling of being discharged with no one to turn to. I felt very hopeless. I felt very desperate. You know, I felt very, I was full of fear, you know, and having nothing to go back to is where, you, you know, you go back straight out back out on the street and, and you get back involved with your old people doing what you do and what you know best to do to get loaded. They might stay for three days or three months, but the charity say if their needs are fully addressed, the chance of going back on the streets is slimmer and the likelihood of hospital readmission much lower. In light of what you've been through, how important do you think it is to have a service like this? Well, for me, you know, if this place was about when as many times I'd hit an hospital landing and, and, and I'd be discharged on the street, to come here to have that 30 day, you know, period where we've got a chance as, a, as the substance use team and, and St Mungo's to, to work with a client, to get their health back, to get their well-being back. This is so important. This gaff saves lives. The cash for this scheme is coming from the government. For them, it could potentially reduce health service costs. To those who use it, though, it's a lifeline. Ria Chatterjee, ITV News. Well, another part of the city tonight, a special event is taking place to raise awareness about youth homelessness. A group of CEOs are leaving the boardroom and sleeping rough for the night. David Wood is in Peyton Oster Square by St Paul's with those taking part. David, what's happening down there? Well, Lucrezia, it's already started to rain a little bit, which isn't ideal for those 13 CEOs who are moving out of the boardroom this evening for the streets here near St Paul's. And one of those who's taking part for the very first time in a sleep out like this is Barclay Card, Barclay Card CEO Dave Chan. Why did you want to get involved in something like this? Hi. Uh, we've been working with Action for Children for several years, and we love the work that they do. Um, and it's really about trying to leverage uh, the profile that I have as a CEO to try to raise awareness around homelessness for children. And are you nervous? Uh, now that it started raining, I'd say <laughs> yes, a little bit. Uh, but it's all for a good cause, so I'm, I'm really happy to have an opportunity to help. One of the other CEOs who's here today is John Hardy, who's uh, my boss, so it's my turn to get a bit nervous and interview you. Um, why did you want to get involved in this? Well, you know, it's, it's a tremendous cause. If it wasn't for people who work at Action for Children, then the whole point of children who are coming from the most dire circumstances, uh, escaping from neglect and from abuse, only to find themselves alone in the hazards of the streets of London. If it wasn't for these people, many of those children would get into worse and worse trouble. So we may be facing a little bit of rain tonight, but apparently the more it rains, the more people gives. So come friendly rain and fall on chief executives, I say. Well, uh, Martin Stu's given us a bit of a personalised forecast, and he says it should clear up eventually, but lows of three degrees tonight. That will be quite cold for you. Well, I, I just say to people, just don't, don't think about us uh, chief executives here in nice uh, sleeping bags. Think about the, the cause that it's worth. So go to the Just Giving site on CEO Sleep Out and donate and follow us through the night. Thank you very much. Good luck. Well, let's come and talk to uh, two of the guys who are involved in organising this. Tony, you're from Action for Children. How big a problem is youth homelessness? Well, we know that there are 100,000 young people sleeping in homeless conditions every year now. In London alone, in the last half of last year, we know that more than 2,000 young people were out in the cold. And we also know that in many parts of the country, rents are rising very sharply. It's getting harder and harder to find somewhere to stay that's safe, warm, and give someone somewhere where they can go and work, for example. And Mike, you've organised this. It's the first one for this charity. Why do you... Where's it going to go in the future? Well, I think, first of all, um, we've been sleeping outside like this in aid of Action for Children for many years already. But this is the first one that's been specifically um, focused on CEOs. Um, we're going to continue to do this every year, and we hope that the 
12, 14 people that are here tonight. It's going to be 30 and 50 and, and uh, more in the, in the years to come. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much and good luck to you all. So let's hope for them that the rain stops and it's not too cold this evening, Lucrezia. Let's hope so. Thank you, David Wood. The ITV News continues with the national and international stories at 6.30. Here's a look at what's happening with Mary Nightingale. Britain's big six energy suppliers could be broken up as they face a full-scale investigation. Ofgem says soaring household bills and growing public distrust highlighted the need for an inquiry. But one supplier warns it could lead to energy blackouts. England's chief medical officer warns obesity has become too normal and a tax on sugar may be necessary. And an exclusive ITV poll reveals 50% of us can't afford to buy a new home. For those stories and more, do join Alistair Stewart and me at 6.30. Now imagine if you could order the dreams you wanted every night before you go to bed. Well, a psychologist from Hertfordshire University says it might just be possible. And guess what? It's thanks to an app. They found playing certain noises can influence dreams. So which would you pick? The beach? Perhaps the city? Or how about a rainforest? A little while ago, I spoke to Professor Richard Wiseman, who's led the project. I asked him how it worked. Uh, well, the, the Dream On app is fairly straightforward. Before people go to bed, they indicate what time they want to wake up. And then in the 30 minutes uh, before that wake up time, the app gently plays in some very pleasant music. And the, the theory is that it influences people's dreams and, and gives them a more sort of positive dream. OK, now you say it's music. Uh, give us some few examples. because It's not just music, is it? it's various noises. So talk us through some and, and how they might influence what we dream about. Well, uh, there are various what we call soundscapes. Uh, so mm -hmm. some of them are relaxing music. Others would be, uh, for example, going for a walk in the park and you hear the birds cheeping in the, the trees. Uh, then there might be a walk in the city, something like that. So various soundscapes that uh, aim to try and influence people's dreams. OK, now you mentioned one there. Now, I, I was reading earlier and there was one called Peaceful Garden. What might we dream about if we listen to that? Well, the app seems to be influencing uh, the, the emotional tone of the dream rather than the, the sort of content of it. So if you're listening to uh, obviously a peaceful garden and you're perhaps hearing a stream and birds cheeping, then the hope would be that uh, you, know, you have those sorts of images in your mind. But what we're seeing from the uh, results is that actually it just makes for a more positive dream because those sorts of uh, sounds you uh, associate with relaxation. Like you mentioned positive dreams. Is there any danger or any risk that we might get nightmares by doing this? Uh, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> the, basically, in our dreams, we're working through our anxieties and concerns. And so anything which makes the dream a little bit more positive is probably pretty good for us psychologically. Now, if you'd put in sounds uh, which weren't so positive, that we associated you know, with something a little bit uh, foreboding, such as the, the sort of psycho uh, sounds or something like that, then I guess that could give people negative dreams. But uh, we're not intending to do that. We don't advise people to do that. Uh, now, Professor Wiseman, while I say it, it does sound like an amazing app, is there something for us to think about the fact that we are constantly, while we are awake, bombarded with noises and sounds? And should we not keep the time when we're asleep for, well, for just doing that, just sleeping? Well, the, uh, the reason we're announcing the results today is they're part of uh, a book that's come out called Night School, which looks at the whole science of sleep and dreaming. And the argument there is that we need to make the most of this missing third of our time. Often we think, oh, it's just downtime, but it isn't. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing all sorts of important things when we sleep in terms of promoting uh, uh, bodily growth. Uh, in terms of uh, psychology, we're working through, as I say, the things that worry us during the day. So it's important to make a, a, the best use of that time as possible. OK, Professor Wiseman, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Now, if you use the cycle hire bike scheme over the next few months and keep your eye out for some special bikes, 101 yellow editions of the bikes have been released into circulation across the capital. It's to mark 100 days until the Tour de France arrives in London. The coloured bikes will be available until the 7th of July. 
The main headlines in London this evening. An official watchdog has accused the Met Police of failing to protect victims of domestic abuse. A report found that despite the force's high arrest rates for abuse, the officers were failing to identify repeat offenders. And Crossrail is to be extended past Maidenhead to Reading. Under new proposals, Crossrail trains will start further west and take passengers into central London without having to change at Paddington. It's much better to have Crossrail running all the way to Reading so that we can start to unlock some of the many economic benefits that will run through to Reading and the Thames Valley region as a result. Well now Martin is here with the weather. Well, I don't know about you, Lucrezia, it feels a bit like a Friday today, so I thought yeah, I'd look really. ahead to the weekend. <laughs> There's three big reasons to do it. First of all, it's Mother's Day, and let me just say, do not forget <laughs> Mother's Day on Sunday. You must buy a card, otherwise you'll be in big trouble. So that's the first thing. Second of all, the clocks go forward. So uh, Saturday night into Sunday, it means the sun's not going to set till 7.30, so getting oh, home brilliant. from work in the light, which is fantastic. Yeah. And the third thing is the weather looks like it's going to be good as well. So actually really nice and warm. I think Saturday is going to be the best of the sunshine, mm -hmm. so a brighter day. Sunday a bit hazier, a bit of cloud around, but nice temperatures. Warmer than Ibiza, warmer than Mykonos. We're looking at 19 <laughs> degrees, possibly 20 <laughs> degrees. That's the good news. Uh, tomorrow, though, isn't quite as warm. So the last of the showers clearing away in the next few hours and then it is a dry and clear night followed by quite a decent day tomorrow, predominantly dry, just with one or two showers by the time we get to the afternoon. The other good bit of news is that temperatures are improving. At the moment, we're drawing cooler air in from the east, but as we head towards the weekend, things start to change. You can see those contours swinging round. So we start to get this warmer air from the continent pushing up towards the London region. So by Mothering Sunday, really nice temperatures getting up to 19 degrees. Relatively chilly though tonight for all of us. Some clear skies around, so temperatures getting down to about three degrees. We should just escape a frost though. Tomorrow morning then starts relatively nicely. One or two bright breaks in between the cloud. Still a bit of a chilly airflow coming in from the east. And if anything, that breeze will pick up into the afternoon. But it starts to swing round. We're bringing up slightly warmer air. And that means temperatures one or two degrees warmer than they've been today. A little bit of sunshine around, but one or two showers dotted around too. After that, things really are starting to improve. So the weekend looks nice. The best of the sunshine on Saturday but the best of the temperatures on Sunday. Hazy sunshine on Sunday, but look at that. For Mothering Sunday, temperatures up at 19 degrees. And now, Martin, you have a story that is quite out of this world. Well, that's right. There's a, a part of one of London's satellite towns, mm -hmm. excuse the pun, <laughs> um, Stevenage, and what they've done is they've got scientists to recreate the surface of Mars using some parts they've bought from DIY shops mm. and it's all to test these new rovers they hope one day they can send to the red planet. Uh, welcome to Airbus Defence and Space and welcome to our own little piece of Mars in Stevenage. Recreating the surface of Mars in a 300 tonne Stevenage sandpit. The rocks may have been bought at a local DIY shop but this 30 metre wide test centre is part of a 1.2 billion pound space project. The facility was opened today by business secretary and MP for Twickenham, Vince Cable. So what you see illustrated here in a, in a modest example is a much bigger story. We have an industry here, a high-tech industry, based in Britain, expanding rapidly, employing 30,000 people. What you can see here is some of the uh, Martian soil simulant we're using. It's designed to be uh, the same as Martian soil, both in terms of grain size and cohesiveness. This will be the training ground for the ExoMars rover, a vehicle which will be sent into space in four years' time. Its mission, to see if there is, or ever has been, life on Mars. We're driven by curiosity. We want to know about other worlds beyond Earth. We want to know what is out there, we want to know how does it looks like, and we want also to understand why it is as we see it is. The rover will be able to drive itself 230 feet a day without the need for remote control from Earth. There's already a NASA rover searching for signs of life on Mars, but the European vehicle will go a step further, using radar and drilling under the surface. Once we're down on the surface, we're primarily looking for signs of life. 
So we have a drill on the front of the rover that allows us to take samples from two meters below the surface, bring that sample back up, and then analyze it for biomarkers. The ExoMars will be launched in 2018 and take 218 Martian days to reach its destination. That's six of our Earth months. Martin Stew, ITV News. Well, that is all from the London team. We're back with the latest after ITV News at 10. Stay with us for the national and international news with Mary Nightingale and Alistair Stewart.